the trend of uh, westernization of management westernization of indian administration is a very sort of a uh, huge trend uh, there are many good things also and there are many issues also obviously there are good good things because you know they have a strategic mind they strategize uh, they have a, a whole uh, tradition of uh, end to end thinking a lot of technology and you know these are things that our people can benefit and learn but what i'm going to talk about is that there's a tendency in the west to develop indexes standards and indexes and impose them on others you make them global so for us to belong to one of these indexes join one of these standards uh there are many issues one issue is are we compromising our own way of thinking because we have borrowed somebody else's way of thinking cryptocurrency failure they had very high sg rating Uh, some of the companies uh, you know like british petroleum burning a lot of fossil fuel and not got good ratings so, so so it also depends on how you managing how who you hire as a consultant but for us nature is living it's a person mother nature it's a being and this mother nature has rights it's not just property it's not just if i if i pollute the water and it's bad for the fish it's because the fish have rights whereas in the western sense the problem is that the fishing industry will lose profit when you convert people you are reducing diversity because you are saying that your is no good mine is good only my way is right way and i want everybody to be like me and that's why you're converting people you're reducing diversity whereas if you say i'll be happy with myself you be happy with you we you are you i am myself we are okay if being different you are encouraging religious diversity what is your fiduciary responsibility so if i invest as a shareholder 100 dollars in your company your fiduciary responsibility is to turn a profit to maximize profit for me not to worry about environment or social justice or governance that is not what i'm investing my 100 dollars in your company for so how come this changed isn't this against the fiduciary responsibility of a company hari om namaskar everybody i like to welcome all of you Uh, and our distinguished guests in the audience and present here uh, to this interaction with uh, shri rajiv malhotra ji and vijaya vishwanathan ji i request our guests to please begin uh, the session by lighting of the holy lamps I now request the director of Institute of Public Enterprises Dr S Srinivasamurthy to address the gathering for a few minutes Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha most respected uh, Shri Rajiv Malhotra ji Professor Vijaya Vishwanathan ji Professor Sri Arvind Rao Garu and most distinguished uh, guests present here a uh, faculty and students of IPE it's a great evening is a red letter day in the history of IPE Uh, Sri Rajiv Malhotra ji agreeing to visit the institute thank you so much sir we welcome you from institute of public enterprise it was started in the year 1964 mainly to help the public sector enterprises in terms of the training research and consultancy requirements over a period of time ip has trained many ias ips and ips officers and ip started exclusive program mba program for uh, public sector executives mba pe with the affiliation of usman university and ip came to management education from 1995 in full time so we have five full time programs on campus with the intake of 540 we have general pgdm pgdm banking insurance and financial services pgdm marketing management pgdm international business and pgdm hrm <coughs> sir we have uh, 60 full time faculty and uh, they are also having uh, publications 
and they guide the students in various activities and the students are there from all parts of the country so it is a great privilege sir to listen to you and uh, we have we have been uh, reading about you our works and certainly our students have benefited faculty have benefited to see you physically and uh, and listen to you is a you will get motivated with your uh, uh, works and also wisdom which you are going to share with us so on behalf of the board and faculty staff students i once again welcome you to the institute of public enterprise and i also thank you for agreeing uh, to the request uh, to host this event i thank uh, pragna bharti uh, more specifically and sri hanuman choudhary garu dr hanuman choudhary garu and the entire team of pragna bharti uh, behind this uh, initiative uh, i don't want to take much time sir would like to listen to you so thank you so much once again namaste <coughs> Thank you, sir. Pragna Bharati is honored to have the privilege of the presence of Mr. Raju Malhotra ji in our presence, and uh, I am very happy to say few words about such towering personality. Raju Malhotra ji is a respected and distinguished thinker on Indic thought. basically educating people against the miscommunication of western ideologues and western universities about the historical and cultural knowledge of india and traditions raju malhotra ji is a graduate in physics from st stephens and masters in computer science from syracuse university then he has started many it companies in the us then at the age of 44 decided to come out of the business world and work for developing indian thought he has written various books breaking india talks about the different forces and fault lines that are trying to destabilize india and the most recent book snakes in the ganga is breaking india part 2 which also of course snakes deal with the divisive forces and ganga is a metaphor for india so how divisive forces are destroying india in between he has also written books on very important treatises on artificial intelligence and its importance in the future of national security and probably the world security and also he has written about indra's net which is about the relevance of vivekananda's thoughts in the present world and some other books and importance of sanskrit in other book raju malhotra ji is a founder of infinity foundation based in princeton new jersey and he is also a proponent of uh, different changes in the education system and also runs an educational council for indic studies we are all eagerly waiting to listen to the wisdom of raju malhotra ji pragna bharati once again thanks him for gracing us with his presence knowledge and wisdom thank you sir i request you to address the gathering namaste so the the recent book snakes in the ganga there's so many different uh, points being made uh, that uh, for each audience we like to pick what's relevant to your career maybe focus on it more than the rest of the book so in the in the since you are getting into management and you'll be running uh, big companies consulting companies you become consultants to other companies running your own companies the trend of uh, westernization of management westernization of indian administration is a very sort of a uh, huge trend uh, there are many good things also and there are many issues also obviously there are good good things because you know they have a strategic mind they strategize uh, they have a, a whole uh, tradition of uh, end to end thinking a lot of technology and you know these are things that our people can benefit and learn 
But what I'm going to talk about is that there's a tendency in the West to develop indexes, standards and indexes, and impose them on others. You make them global. So for us to belong to one of these indexes, join one of these standards, uh, there are many issues. One issue is, are we compromising our own way of thinking? Because we have borrowed somebody else's way of thinking. And did we have our own way of thinking that we should have revived instead? Another question is, when we adopt their way of thinking, are they always going to be better than us because it's their way of thinking? And we'll be second class, second class in, because it's their way of thinking. They'll control, evaluate, judge, and we'll have to comply with their standard. And so they will make the rules and they will appoint the judge. And so we have to always be sort of at a handicap. It's like uh, if uh, the debate is going to happen in your native language, then the other side will be at a disadvantage and vice versa. Same way, if there's a framework that everybody's going to follow, but somebody has controlled it, and they continue to control in the future, then they will have an advantage. And I would go a step further and say, is that a form of colonization? To say that uh, we're all equal, we're all free, everybody has equal opportunity, but I under my rules. I made the rules and then you all play the game. So uh, what I'm going to talk about are, for instance, as an example, what I'm going to talk about is ESG which all of you are learning, all of you have learned ESG. I saw that in the course curriculum. Before coming here, I wanted to find out what you're studying. Everybody in India is studying ESG because there's a market for it. Corporates expect you to know. But E stands for environment, the whole environmental uh, you know, movement. And there are indexes to see who's more green, less green and all that. And S is about society, society, social justice, societal. So who's got more diversity, who's more inclusive, who's got social justice, human rights. Again, somebody has to decide what that means. And G is governance, what sort of governance you have. Is it fair and are people represented and things like that. Now, on the surface of it is wonderful. It seems like a universally desirable thing that we should have a good environment, we should have good society with justice, and we should have good responsible governance. But then the question is, how do you measure it and who decides that index? So if you take the, social, the environment, there's a whole pushback under this whole environment, even in the United States, because people are saying that this environment movement uh, has a criteria has a criteria for evaluating which certain people have made. Uh, World Economic Forum, uh, some think tanks, Harvard, these kind of people, they've come up with this uh, index. And so now they have hired, they've trained consultants who go around like these big consulting companies, the Deloitte's and the Ernst and Young's and McKinsey's. And they, they hired a lot of people like you also. You might be working for some of these companies. And they, in India, they have Indians leading, so we think it's all Indian stuff, but it's not. And then the idea is that using these criteria, they're evaluating how is Reliance how scale on, on a scale, and how is uh, uh, you know Tata's, and how is this one, and how is that one. And so everybody's clamoring for better ratings, because better ratings means you'll get better funding. Your it's like credit rating. Now this is. Uh, this rating will also determine how many people are willing to invest in you. And if your rating goes down, then a lot of investors will pull out. So, so there is that going on. But when you look at the facts, some of the, like this, this uh, very big uh, uh, cryptocurrency failure, they had very high ESG rating. Uh, some of the companies... Uh, you know, like British Petroleum burning a lot of fossil fuel and all got good ratings. So, so, so it also depends on how you're managing, how, who you hire as a consultant. 
and it's sort of like a bit of a jugad and a bit of a uh, scam also in the sense that and now people are beginning to talk about the scam ESG as a scam people in the United States are talking about it that there are it's it's not it's not transparent who made the criteria and on why they made the criteria that way for in measuring and how come the world the people around the world didn't get to participate in deciding what is what is their idea so if you look at environment from the indian traditional point of view <clears throat> you're talking about mother nature that's what you're talking about so to evaluate your behavior and your conduct towards mother nature is a very important thing in our dharma it's one of the one of the things that you, you have a responsibility you have a duty to protect the nature but for us nature is living it's a person mother nature it's a being and this mother nature has rights it's not just property it's not just if i if i pollute the water and it's bad for the fish it's because the fish have rights whereas in the western sense the problem is that the fishing industry will lose profit the different reason if i don't want to over harvest a in ayurved you only harvest at a certain time when the plant is in its cycle plant has a cycle and you only harvest at certain points in time when you don't harm the plant and you only harvest a certain amount the western idea would be that uh, you want to maximize the yield and you therefore optimize when to harvest how much to harvest for optimizing the yield it's not because the plant has rights and the plant is a being it's not that you see and the reason you don't want to you you consume too much natural resources is because it's man's property and may run out you know i don't want to deplete my property so the whole um, tradition starts in the bible where god tells man that this is your world is made for your pleasure it is your property so if the world is your property then protecting it there is one kind of ethics and one kind of values but in our tradition it is not our property the world is not our property we are part of the world and inseparable from the world and the world is being is a person personhood so the whole philosophy of environment is different and therefore protecting it is a different kind of a standard for us you see so the question is then when we are talking about environment we are including animals it's not just climate so what about non veg should we say that there is should be negative those people should be kind of in trouble because they are harming the environment to us they are part of the environment you see so whose philosophy do you use and why is it that one civilization's philosophy because they've conquered the world and colonized the world and the english language has spread uh, why is it that their particular world view should become the universal standard that is what in my book being different i call western universalism meaning that their history and their experiences which are very good very profound very valuable for them but to universalize it and say that this should be applied to all people everywhere is kind of a uh, unfair just because they have more power i mean native americans have a whole different attitude towards environment africans have different attitude towards environment so whose idea of environment are we going to consider and is it only a measure of making sure that uh, uh, we we don't have too much uh, carbon footprint and things like that but there are many other things about environment that ought to be considered for us then when you talk about social justice you know that the idea they promoting is uh, diversity the dei movement you'd all be part of dei diversity equity inclusion but india is the most diverse country in the world so before they come and teach us how to measure us the point is the the loss of diversity is their problem because they wanted to conquer in the name of one religion one book one church everybody else and wipe out everybody else as heathens and infidels and so on so they lost the diversity that was there we have 
every 100 kilometers you go, there's different practices, different foods, different ethnicity, different deities, different languages, dialects. So we, we don't need a HR policy to bring diversity because we might mess up, mess it, mess with it. We better leave it alone because it is already diverse. So this business of uh, a codified rule-based diversity imposed from the headquarters is a very alien concept to us. Our diversity was not the result of some centralized HR department in some capital which made policies and imposed laws and measured everybody's diversity and went around with inspectors and punishing them and saying you are more diverse, you are less, you should be punished and you should be rewarded. It was not the result of that. How did we become diverse? That has to be studied. Before you, before you succumb to some diversity index and some diversity system from somewhere else, you should first ask, well, we have been diverse. Let's first figure out how, why, what brought, why made us so diverse compared to other people. That has not been properly studied. So why are we going to tamper with the system which has produced diversity by bringing in ideas from another system which has not produced diversity. So this is, this is a philosophical issue that you, you are, I'm, I'm raising issues that are not practically useful in the narrow context of maximizing your career. So when you go for a job interview, don't say all this. Really, but you should think, there are certain things you have to think and say, aha, they're making me do this. I have no choice. I got to put bread on the table. I have to make money and, you know, but I have to think for myself too. I may, maybe I'm not going to speak like that now, but maybe one day I will. Maybe I'll be the boss or maybe one day I'll get a chance to express my views and I will. So I'm, teach, I'm putting that in your thought, planting that seed. Whether you want to talk about it now or later, or that I don't know, it's your call. Some of you may want to become, uh, uh, you know, authors, writers, faculty, teaching another point of view. Some of you may be scholars who want to develop uh, our index. What would be, according to our tradition, a way of measuring these kind of things. Now, when you look at uh, equity in the DEI, the E is equity, not equality. I don't know how many of you know the difference between equity and equality. How many of you know that? What is the difference between equity and equality? We, some people, one person knows. Very good. Very good. No, no, I, I, I'm glad you know. So, equality means everybody has equal opportunity and equal rights. But not equal outcome. It's like you're having a race. Everybody starts the same. When the... When it says go, everybody runs, everybody's equal chance. And some will run faster than others. Outcome will not be the same. I may not be running fast, you know. Somebody else runs faster. Equity means we want equal outcome. It's like saying that regardless of the scores, certain percentage of people of some culture or identity or minority have to be admitted. So the outcome has to be clear, have to be determined. What percentage will come from here, there, there, what, what percentage of male, female, this religion, that religion, this caste, that caste. So evaluating the, uh, coming up with an allocation of uh, uh, results by, uh, uh, by identity is equity. That is what they're calling equity. And this term started in the United States because they wanted affirmative action for blacks and for minorities and things like that. So they, they came up with this idea that we have to champion equity. But that's not the same thing as equal equality because equality is of opportunity. Now, the, the irony is that the liberalism in America always championed equality. Martin Luther King never asked for equity. He just said, I want a level playing field. For my people, whites, blacks, everybody, and whoever is good will win. John F. Kennedy, liberal. Jimmy Carter, president, very, very liberal. They championed equality. Even till the time of Bill Clinton, they championed equality and also Barack Obama championed equality. But now, under wokeism and critical race theory, it is equity being championed which, rather than equality. So when you just get sucked into di diversity, equity, inclusion, it is perfectly fair for you to raise your hand in class and say, can you please explain what is equity versus equality? If you want to get a two-minute version, uh, 
Uh, you might be familiar with the Bill Maher show. You familiar with Bill Maher? He's a comedian. And he, there is a two, three minute clip. So he, he brings in Bernie Sanders and he says, uh, on your web page, you have mentioned you support equality. But your, your party is now supporting equity. Would you like to tell the audience the difference between equity and equality? So he puts him on the spot. And he's, he's, uh, Bernie Sanders is very uncomfortable. He just he tries to say, uh, uh, I don't know. He kind of pretends. He first pretends and he says, but you have it on your website. So what he's trying to show is that by your own criteria, you're on your followers and the, you're playing double. You're a hypocrite because you're, you have believed in equality all your life. But now the fashion is equity. So you're going for that. That's what he wants to say. It's a very nice two minute funny thing. If I, I, I have it somewhere. Uh, that uh, that uh, clip. So if you want to know what is the difference between equity and equality in two minutes, you can you can do that. There are lots of uh, uh, if you just search equity versus equality, you will get a few quick answers in your career where you in you will be required to follow DEI policies and E is equity. You better know the difference. I mean, none of you except one raised hand. You have to know the difference. And you have to be informed and you have to be able to explain. You have to be able to ask an intelligent question, an innocent question saying, how is equity different than equality? And how is it, who believes in the equality and who believes in the equity? And you take the statements of all the, uh, whether it's Gandhi, whether it is in our country, whether it's in their country, whether it is, you know, whoever, Buddha or all that, nobody talk about equity, they talk about equality of human beings. So, you know, you, you are being brought, brainwashed gradually into a sort of uh, a way of thinking, which I would classify as col colonized thinking in a sense. And it is, you are, I feel very sorry because you have no choice. You need a career and the careers uh, that the universities are training you for are the careers that the companies want and the companies want as part of the globalization this is what the companies want. They have no choice. So there is a whole world order which is imposing itself on uh, Indian corporates, Indian universities, Indian think tanks and government offices and all that. And uh, this index-based thinking uh, is uh, driving the education of people. So it's uh, education to get jobs, to become you know important and all that by taking these ideas and values and making them part of your ethos. And that is, uh, it, it takes a lot of audacity for someone to stand here and say that is a colonial system. It is not part of who you are. And it is not an easy, I don't know the answer what, to, what I would advise you to do because you also have to be very practical in your life. But it's better, you're better off being well informed whether you can take action and resist all this or whether you have to go along with it, it's better that you at least know about it. It's better that you not fool yourself, you see. So there are many indexes like this I could talk about. There's also now a new index on uh, religious pluralism, how much religious diversity there is. Okay, that's also coming out of uh, an American organization, uh, a Christian organization. When you convert people, you're reducing diversity because you're saying that your is no good, mine is good, only my way is the right way and I want everybody to be like me. And that's why you're converting people, you're reducing diversity. Whereas if you say, I'll be happy with myself, you'll be happy with you, you are you, I'm myself, we are okay if being different, you are encouraging religious diversity. So actually they are reducing diversity, we have had diversity, but they have come up with this index of religious diversity in the businesses and they're going around uh, measuring companies in different countries and giving awards saying you are you are, you are the most diverse company uh, you are the most diverse CEO religious diversity CEO so this uh, way of winning people over buying them over with awards uh, and then then getting them into a trap because once you bought into their system then they're going to evaluate you every year and then they're going to say don't have don't don't do this don't do that because then your rating will go down so as long as you're in the ratings trap and index trap, you have to kind of conform to somebody else's rules 
who somebody else who made the rules of the game, who trained all the consultants, uh, and who uh, uh, controls, you know, how you'll be treated. Now you know there is something in uh, China called uh, social credit. How many of you know social credit system in China? They are evaluating every citizen, uh, you know, using facial recognition, what your behavior is, are you mixing with the wrong people, the right people, are you uh, praying too much in the wrong church or mosque or not or whatever. Uh, they're looking at your whether you went through a traffic light, whether you paid your taxes, whether you did well in scores. I mean, every little thing you are tracked, like with uh, surveillance system, and this artificial intelligence surveillance system gives you a score of how good a citizen you are. It's like imagine if the Aadhaar card, with the Aadhaar card, they kept track of every little thing you do. You know, did you spend uh, too much? Did you wake up late? Or I mean, if the, if the system knows your movements every second of your whole life, then it can come up with algorithms to evaluate you. And this kind of, uh, this is what China is perfecting for all its citizens. And this is called social credit system. It's kind of like a rate, an index of rating citizens. And this is this is Big Brother then deciding who will get awards, who will get who will get admission, who who will be pre given preference for hospital treatment if there is some treatment needed, uh, who will get in uh, in upgrade here there. So your society will treat you and give you recognition and, and uh, based on how good is your score. And your, so it's sort of like a government controlled karma system, almost. Except this is government Bhagwan. Government is the Bhagwan saying, okay, you, your karma rating is this much. This fellow is better. Now you have to. Cover. So it's a way to keep you obedient also. So this is a very interesting thing that's happened. And the West is criticizing China for uh, having a social credit system because the West says that it violates personal freedom and so on. But the West is doing its own thing, which is also a social credit system. In fact, the West's social credit system is not individuals, but corporates. The ESG is a corporate social credit system. It says your corporate will be evaluated on how good its behavior is. So it's a, it's a, it's a social credit system at an institutional level. Every institution in the world to be evaluated, you see. So there's one AI system to evaluate ESG which says that uh, we will track the images, facial recognition can recognize the, uh, uh, the, the board members and the CEO, where he's been, who he's shaking hands with, is he, is he hugging only white people or also black people? So, you know, Mukesh Ambani's ESG could depend on all, everywhere he goes, whether he does namaskar to the uh, lower level person or only a higher level person, and did he shake hands with the Dalit or not? I mean, so this ESG rating with, by AI will tell, will come up with a score of uh, uh, Mukesh Ambani's ESG. So, so this kind of an AI-based social credit is a very strange kind of a thing. And you, it's your, I'm not, I, these things are not going to bother me. I'm okay. I'm 72 years old. Nothing's going to affect me. But your life is going to be run by these things. And that's what I'm telling you about. So you have to be concerned about being evaluated, measured, watched, surveillance, and put into these indexes and into these various uh, ways of uh, being rewarded and so on. Uh, now, and the worst part of it is, in at least in China's case, they are controlling. It's not a foreign country. Their own government controlling. In our case, it is Western indexes controlling you. Western indexes controlling you. Your behavior on social media controlled by the Googles of the world in terms of what they think of you or your profile and whether your post will boost or not boost and whether you whether you are said something that they want you to say or not say, uh, you know, and, and your uh, company's uh, social credit as ESG and other kind of rating systems controlled by Western consultants uh, who are coming and evaluating you and bankers and financial industry deciding whether to fund you or not. So this is a, a this is a future uh, risk of sovereignty of a country uh, and and uh, you, it's something that you should I'm I would like that some professors here uh, should also give you a lecture on what are the risks and pitfalls of all the things all the systems that you are being taught 
you should also reflect on okay how can it how how can it backfire on my values and should i be careful about it so uh, i i'm addressing the students but i'm also hoping some faculty will take note of this uh, thank you very much for listening and we'll take some questions later on after vijaya has spoken thank you thank you sir for your enlightening address i am now delighted to introduce professor shrimati vijaya vishwanathan ji shrimati vijaya ji is the co-author of snakes in the ganga book vijaya vishwanathan ji is an mba from watton business school of university of pennsylvania she is also an engineering graduate from university of massachusetts she is a great scholar in indic studies and presently associated with according to her online profile bishma school of indic studies pune and sanskrit academy chennai agastya gurukulam in the us so she is a very learned scholar both in technology and also in terms of vedic and indian philosophy and indian Uh, culture so i request her to address this gathering and share her views with us thank you ma'am <clears throat> namaste sarve bhya so rajiv ji talked about esg and i just wanted to add a few more points to tell you what some of the people who are waking up to this nightmare are doing in the west so there is a big movement in the west where they are asking companies especially publicly traded companies what is your fiduciary responsibility so if i invest as a shareholder 100 dollars in your company your fiduciary responsibility is to turn a profit to maximize profit for me not to worry about environment or social justice or governance that is not what i'm investing my 100 dollars in your company for so how come this changed isn't this against the fiduciary responsibility of a company because i never voted for this so what has happened is the big pension funds in the us have been investing in three large institutional investors which is vanguard state street and blackrock and these guys right uh, larry fink of blackrock especially they control trillions of dollars in assets assets under management so they can buy a board seat right they put their own people on the board although it is the money of the average american that they are using to invest but but they have say on the board for example exxon mobil is told it's an oil company and it's told that you should not be drilling anymore you should because it's uh, you know because of the carbon uh, emissions so here's an oil company that's what they are in the business for but blackrock has placed its members on the board of exxon and and so the ceo has to bring down oil production which hurts exxon sh you know share price but, but of course the esg rating is high now if you look at the silicon valley bank which went down a couple of days ago they had fantastic esg rating in fact uh, one of the things under the esg social justice also you know uh, getting more women into the workforce and all of that and uh, i think 3 or 4 days before the bank went down the women bankers posted apparently um, something on linkedin you know showing how you know the women bankers are really doing well at silicon valley bank and more power to women bankers and things like that glorifying feminism and this, this and that you know all the the woke ideas uh, on social justice so of course they had a great esg rating and then lo and behold a lot of people you know stand to lose a lot of money so again where is fiduciary responsibility and what should be done about it versus esg now 
in America, what's also happening is as people are waking up to this, there are many that are saying the global forces behind ESG, which is the World Economic uh, Forum in, in Davos, um, and these theories, as we show in the book, Snakes in the Ganga, emanating out of Harvard, um, they are imposing these ideas uh, on corporations, on, on um, you know, through the UN, onto countries. So countries have a social, um, uh, you know, a, so a social credit rating. Uh, for example, again, uh, to Rajiv Ji's point, um, a Yale professor recently said about Japan's aging population that uh, maybe the old people should just commit uh, suicide uh, to lessen the burden on on the economy of the youngsters right in a culture that reveres its uh, you know elderly in canada they have expanded uh, their assisted suicide program to people with severe mental illness because the canadian government thinks that assisted suicide is better than a severe illness right these are deep ethical issues and yet these countries will have higher esg ratings than india where we we try to keep our elderly with us and and revere them and do namaskaram and things like that so again goes to show whose idea of social justice or human rights we're talking about now the world economic forum also wants um, if, uh, you know, when they, they have this whole program to encourage venture capital. See, public companies, you can sort of control with ESG and there's a stock price and there's rating, so it's all public. But how do you, ca how do you control uh, venture capitalists, venture, small companies that venture capitalists invest in? So they've come up um, with a system to, to do that, to impose these ideas on uh, venture capitalists and then they want to go into angel investing as well. And one of the things that they casually say is that uh, if venture capitalists should uh, invest in certain companies, especially overseas, uh, they have to um, get reports from Amnesty International, uh, in NGOs like Amnesty International. Amnesty International has gone into trouble with the law in India. So if you're a small company wanting venture capital funding, they'll ask you for an Amnesty International report you know, of, of, a, of the city or the surrounding area or whatever, and that, that might be negative in terms of human rights and so this company will not get funding tomorrow if you're a small business and you say you know i'm not into venture capital and i'm not going to work for a big company i'm just going to do my own thing say you're making some vases and you're just selling it the logistics company will refuse to you know ship your goods because you're not esg compliant your insurer will refuse to insure you because you're not esg compliant so this has this has deep uh, effects, and it's going to it's it's uh, like Rajiv Ji said. Even I, I probably won't live long enough to see the full effects of all of this, but it's going to affect all of you. Now, in the U.S., what they're doing is they're coming up with something called a parallel patriotic economy, because they have realized that this monster is so large and so all pervasive. It's in the government, it's in, in um, corporates, it's in schools. Uh, they don't know what to do with it. All the institutions have been captured by the woke. So the only way they think that they can get out, at least in the next decade or so, is to have a parallel economy. So there is a whole platform that's being built uh, for this patriotic economy where there's none of this ESG crap. So there, there will be service providers, uh, bankers, lawyers, uh, doctors, all these professionals and small businesses and people who want to take part in this parallel economy. So these are ideas that, that America is floating. And, and very soon we have to also um, think of ideas like this till we defeat this big ESG monster because uh, as I said, it's, it's everywhere. Now, when you go into a corporation, uh, you are going to have uh, diversity training. Yeah, the HR is going to enforce diversity training on you. Now, in the Snakes in the Ganga book, we talk about how um, race has become caste in India. 
So all the race, race based training for diversity that they do in America is going to be caste based training over here. So you will have race sensitivity training in the West and you will have caste sensitivity training over here. Now, what does that mean? So essentially, it's a sort of a three step process. The first step is to make so you go into this training, they're going to paint uh, that, you know, paint a picture which says that all problems of society is because of Hinduism and caste. They give you many examples, give you statistics, all of that. And then you and then you say that, well, maybe true, but I have nothing to do with it. I haven't done anything wrong, anything wrong and I'm not a casteist and I, I hold no bias. In fact, I, I don't even care what my caste is. You can go on with that. But then the idea is in the first step to make you understand your privilege, even if you as an individual did not commit any crime. Yeah, because you were born in a certain family and that makes you culpable. The very fact that you're born to, to a family which they consider as upper caste or privileged, even though you could have come from very humble beginnings or poor um, you know, families and things like that, it doesn't matter. It is what the woke considers privileged. And if they say you are privileged, you better accept it. Then at the end of it, you say, okay, well, okay, maybe I do come from a privileged background because I have connections. Caste is sort of a capital that I sort of carry with me, even though I come from a poor background, whatever. You accept that. Then, then the, the tamasha begins where they say, now I'm the DEI guy and I give you the solution. And then you start this process of, it's like um, the Chinese, um, you know, um, uh, Mao's uh, psychological um, uh, breaking down, right? That's what they do. They psychologically will break you down to accepting that, and you have to accept all kinds of things that you never did. Um, that you're a casteist, you, you come from families of oppression and you, we've, we've done it historically, we've done it for generations and therefore you have guilt and shame. And then the next step would be atonement. So Mao did this in his prison, uh, you know, to many people uh, and this will happen in, in corporate houses. And so the next piece is the atonement piece where you will have to say, you can't just virtue signal and say, yeah, yeah, sure, I agree and I, I'm with you, buddy, good, yeah, let's get out of here. That's not going to happen. What it means to atone is to be an active participant. You can't be passively saying, yeah, yeah, good, good, I, I'm with you in spirit, yeah, I agree with you. That doesn't cut it. They want your active participation. And what does active participation mean? It means you have to become an activist. You have to go out there and, you know, like we were in uh, in the Hyderabad uh, Central University today, you know, with, you know, with protesters and all that. So you have to actually go and protest. You have to um, become an ally where you fight these causes. You you use your so-called privilege to to break down society, which is considered, you know, built on privilege. So this is what they mean by active participation, being an ally. So these sort of words, right? You have to understand what it means. So being an ally is not, okay, I'm, I'm an ally, I'm a friend. It's not like that. Being an ally means active participation. So whenever you see all these words in the lexicon of, you know, of the left, you have to ask yourself, what is the definition? What is diversity? So diversity means bringing in certain people at the expense of others. Equity means you know, not everybody is equal. You push down some people and you bring up some people. So you make it unequal so that outcome is equal. Right? And inclusion is essentially excluding, yeah? Excluding certain populations, marginalized or, you know, these synthetic uh, identities, right? That they come up with to bring, um, to include others. So they all have opposite meanings and, and totally different meanings. It sounds very good on the surface. Like who is not for environmental sustainability? Who is not for it? So these, everything has to be, you have to question everything, get clear definitions, 
what does it mean what does it entail what does it to, you know what does it mean to be an ally what does it mean you know so you and and, and you should refuse participation in such uh, you know brainwashing at, in at, in you know in in a business house and i would also say that since you all are young you should take risks and even quit jobs to make a statement if you are forced to do that because what is a life is not worth living if you haven't lived it with conviction and courage right and you can do it when you are young and so question everything and don't succumb to peer pressure and these western ideas and western standards of diversity equity inclusion the last thing i want to tell you is even these these organizations like united nations unesco have all been bought out the who is bought out by the gates foundation and the chinese in fact last week um, they had 193 countries sign a pandemic treaty we didn't vote for it so your healthcare professional whatever he might say say you have a family doctor you pra- you love going to ayurveda and they say uh, that these are sort of the prescriptions i'll give you for a certain this is the diagnosis and this is how i want to treat you uh uh-uh, uh that's not going to work because india signed Uh, a treaty with the who who uh, to say that you know they they will decide the next pandemic is i don't know if it's being planned or is coming um and they will decide when to lock down whom to lock down how long to lock down what you should wear now you know that masks are not you know they don't really work but of course you're forced to wear a mask so this these are all ways to these are practice sessions if you will to control people and this is the beginning of the social credit system you have to look at it from a meta level bigger level and this whole idea of central central bank digital currency is another thing it's great you can avoid black money all of that it has its plus side but on the downside think about it say you don't obey say you're under lockdown and you say you know what i'm tired of being in the house i just need to go for a walk and somebody catches you your your digital currency is now a coupon because if you disobey i can just it's not money anymore it's it's a coupon it's like a, a welfare check right you you go and, and and so people can turn it off like tap you know you can turn it off and on so the central bank digital currency is great but if your social credit you know score is low they can just turn it off and leave you high and dry with no access to your own hard earned money so this is where this whole thing is going your money is a coupon that can be turned off if you do not behave and if you are not obedient this is the world that you guys are going to be living in and good luck to you